Again, I see some new attendees signing in. Thanks ever so much for joining us this evening. Give it a try with our November bird quiz. All you have to do is simply think of the 14 bird species that can be found in Ohio uh, that have the word yellow in their name. Now these can be birds that are migrants, they can be residents, they can be extinct species, they can be eruptive species. So can you list the names of common birds found in Ohio with the word yellow in their name? I know probably some of you are saying, I can't think of a single one with the word yellow in its name. Yes, you can. I think you'll do better than you think. Again, for any new people attending, we have our November bird quiz up on the screen. Can you list the names of, of common birds uh, found in Ohio, the common names of birds found in Ohio? There are only 14 bird species with the word yellow as part of their name. So this evening, Tuesday, November 3rd, Welcome to the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Speaker Series, and we are thrilled with our speaker this evening. Uh, again, I see some new folks signing in. Please do join us. We are going to have a great time this evening. Um, we've got lots to announce. We've got uh, some of our board members that have some things that they would like to share, and I'd like to introduce some, some of our board members. We um, about a half an hour before our program started, we have a, a quiz, and we simply ask people to list 14 species of birds commonly found in Ohio, the common names of 14 species of birds with the word yellow, Y-E-L-L-O-W, -L -L with the word yellow in as part of their name. And we're going to go over those answers just real, real shortly. So again, I want to welcome everybody this evening. I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And you know what else I want to do this evening? I want to take you away from politics. How about that? Don't worry, you'll be, there'll be plenty to hear later tonight and into tomorrow. But for this hour and a half or so, just think about nature, think about what our, our topic is, think about birds, and think about what a, a, the science that we're going to be learning tonight. So forget the politics. It'll come and hit you in another time, a little bit later this evening. And boy, did everybody get a chance to enjoy today, whether you went out and voted, whether you went out and took a walk, what a day it was. And I guess the next couple days in, uh, are going to be just as, as nice as today. So, so please do take advantage of that. It's early November, and we know what can happen in November. So thank you for joining us. Um, let's uh, do a real quick intro of our, our board. Uh, and for those board members who are uh, do not have their, their video on, just put yourself on. And when I mention your name, just give a nice quick wave. All righty, Gloria Ferris. Gloria, give a nice quick wave, Gloria. There we are. There's Gloria, one of our board members. Karu. Karu is here. Give a nice way. There's Karu. Wonderful. Thanks, Karu. Uh, I'm not sure if Marianne and Tom Romito have rejoined us. They were having a little problem with their audio. Uh, Amanda Sobrowski. Amanda, give a quick wave. Let's see Amanda here. Where's Amanda? Hey. Uh, and Michelle Brocious. Michelle, give a nice quick wave as well. Terrific. Uh, and of course, uh, our IT person, person that, that pulled together this evening's program and, and pr preparing us for this evening's program, Betsy O'Hagan. And she's going to be running a number of things for us. So thank you, Betsy, so much. All righty. Let's see about these uh, these answers for this bird quiz. Do we have that, that list of answers that we could pull up? There we go. So take a quick look. Again, these are all birds that can be found in Ohio. These are the common names. 
And, uh, yeah, yeah, some of them are a little bit more common. Cuckoos and sapsuckers and things like the common yellow throat and yellow warbler for sure. Everybody got that one, right? All right. And then some are a little less common. Yellow rail, I've never seen one. Never seen one in Ohio, let alone never seen one. Um, let's see. Another yellow-headed blackbird is kind of a, a newer bird coming into Ohio. It generally was a western species, but now seems to be making a little inroad, just particularly in the western part of the state. So just take a quick look and see how well you did. Uh, if you want to put your, your how many you got correct in the chat, we'd love to see how many you got correct uh, of our bird quiz. And by the way, these uh, answers were obtained from the Ohio Ornithological Society's official checklist of birds. Uh, again, they are birds that, uh, six steps, not bad. All right, that's wonderful, Karoo. Um, and so again, these, these could be migrants, these could be residents, these could be even, even extinct species. But thank goodness none of these that are listed are extinct. Amanda, good job. All right. Fantastic. Wonderful. All right. So uh, we got our bird quiz, quiz answers. And so let's see what's happening next, Betsy. Oh, next slide. I can't even remember. Ah, Michelle. Michelle Brocious is our, oh, again, I mentioned a board member. She waved to us a little earlier. She's also our field trip co-coordinator. And she's going to share with us information on our virtual field trips as well as trip, field trips we've had in the past. Take it away, Michelle. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, so first, I want to talk about the second Saturday um, Birdwalk Report, and then I will go over virtual field trip information and then some social distancing birding guidelines. Next slide, please. All right. So. Um, I just want to mention in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Uh, however, Bill Dininer and Dave Grasskemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. Uh, the October 2nd Saturday was, an, this is what they said in their report, the October 2nd Saturday was an excellent morning with temperatures from 67 to 75 degrees, sunny the entire walk and a light occasional breeze. 35 species were observed. It was a slow day for birds. Highlights included a nice turkey vulture in an overhead display doing acrobatics in a windy blue sky. There were at least eight yellow rump warblers, some feeding on the berries of the red leaf poison ivy vines. Two Carolina wrens were very vocal. 25 robins and two hermit thrush were also feeding on various berries in several trees in several locations. Many other birds were playing hide and seek and actively ducking into leafy bushes and trees. And next slide, please. The October virtual field trip report. So last month, our virtual field trip was at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve to see warblers, kinglets, and sparrows. Uh, five participants visited the preserve throughout the month. I am currently compiling the bird list, the journaling, and photos that were submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you went to Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and you haven't sent me your items yet, please get those over to me by end of day on Friday. Um, I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, November 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, even if you didn't have a chance to visit Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve, uh, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook and we can talk about our experiences uh, and see if anyone else has anything additional to share. All right. All right. Um, so this month's virtual field trip takes place at Richfield Heritage Preserve. So we will be looking for woodpeckers and nuthatches. And there's actually been an eruption of red-breasted nuthatches in the northeastern U.S. this autumn. Uh, these birds rely on cyclical food sources, uh, typically cone seeds of spruce and fir trees. And their distribution varies accordingly from year to year, depending on the abundance of their food source. So um, the nut hatches are up south into the eastern U.S. roughly every two years. And um, this year is a good year to see them in Ohio. All right. So 
During your visit to the preserve, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, write down your thoughts, create a poem, a haiku, uh, write down any questions or curiosities you have about the target species or anything encountered at the location. Uh, send any of these items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the November 2020 virtual field trip tile on the home page. Next slide, please. All right, so lastly, uh, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, uh, wearing a face mask, and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Nancy. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah, the, the field trips, the virtual field trips are, are great fun. You know, again, going out on your own, coming back with your lists and, and write-ups and things like that. And then even better is when we have the meetups and everybody shares what they found. And it, it's, it's great fun. And you can do the meetups even if you don't go out on the, uh, any of the field trips, but you can join and say, oh, that looked awesome. I should join in for the next month's field trip. So thanks again, Michelle. Uh, Gloria, Gloria Ferris ha will share information on fundraising and um, probably a few other things too, right, Gloria? Don't forget to unmute yourself. I am. Yeah, I just did it. Uh, yes, Nancy, we've got a lot of things going on. And um, so anyway, I... Uh, Oh, we'll be talking about the book club for November, our guardians of nature, what they have going, and what we'll be discussing in November, and um, our bird of the month fundraiser, and then for the photography contest, we had two entrants for this month. One um, entrant uh, submitted two photos, and one submitted one photo. So I'll be uh, saying who the winner is uh, during my um, presentation. And then I want to talk about Nature's Nursery Center in White House, Ohio, and um, some programming that we're going to have from November, uh, thanks to them and their fundraiser uh, for raising funds for their conservation uh, rehab center. So uh, next slide, please. Well, many of you may know this bird eating french fries, seen it before. This is David Lindo, our guest, our celebrity birder from the UK, came last November right at this time to uh, <clears throat> visit us and talk to us and help us start our urban birding initiative. So we are very fortunate to have David once again talking to us about how to be an urban birder. He's going to be sharing tips and pointers. He's going to talk about local patches. He's going to say where to look for birds in towns and cities. There's going to be a lot of information um, for <clears throat> uh, beginning birders and maybe birders who go to preserves and um, <clears throat> preserves and refuges, but they don't look at the parks and um, their backyards that they have very close to them. So he will be here, and then he is also, we have a book discussion as well, and he also is going to uh, be with us for that session and is going to share some of his favorite nature books. Uh, it's, it's really fun when our authors join us. So if you would like to uh, come to both sessions, it's $20. If you would like to 
uh, come to one session. It is $12 for non-members and $10 for members. And as all of our tickets, they are available at uh, <clears throat> our website. I have one last thing. Our October author was Katie Fallon, and her book was Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. Her publisher, the University of Chicago, has given our members and our friends a 20% discount on her book until November 9th. So you can go to wcaudubon.org, click on education, go to news blog, uh, look at the search for Vulture, and it will take you, she is the second item under Vulture for that code. But it is the University of Chicago Press, and we do have a discount code for that it, that is available until November 9th. And it is really a great book. Um, that's it. That's, that's all I have for um, our book club for November. Next slide. Our Guardians of Nature uh, continues to offer feedback and um, <clears throat> suggestions for our programming. Right now, we're discussing um, the possibility of a new way to uh, garner members and uh, make our community outreach to young people more uh, attainable for uh, youngsters and teens. So if you're into um, activities for and would like to uh, interact with young people, our Thursday uh, meetups are for anyone who would like to come, members, non-members, board members. And uh, we do ask that you register just so we have an idea of who comes. So I hope to see some new people, some new faces, um, because we have some new faces at this uh, uh, Hunter's uh, presentation tonight. Next slide. Okay, in August, uh, we started a Bird of the Month fundraiser. Not to raise a lot of funds, but to uh, raise awareness and uh, give some information on some of our well-known uh, birds in Ohio. And uh, the donations that you make to this is um, to support chapter conservation education efforts. So um, we usually have a little... Uh, description of the bird of the month and we also started a um, photography fundraiser and um, it also is the American turkey. I guess we could go to the next slide, Betsy. Oops, this is our winner. <laughs> I saw that Luke Peterson is here with us tonight and he won um, the photo contest for October, and Luke will uh, be deciding um, whether he would like a copy of How to Be an Urban Birder or a um, fan dex of either trees, birds, or butterflies. And Luke, we will be contacting you soon. Thank you so much uh, for entering and we hope that you uh, decide to enter more of our contest and I hope some people who see this will say hey I have some beautiful photos of uh, an American turkey and I would like to submit it. Our other entrance this um, October was Paul Schweikert and he will be receiving a um, urban birding t-shirt and we hope that he continues to uh, send in his photos for our contest. Um, they, we had three really great entrants and we're hoping to build this. So if you know a photographer, please let them know. And um, thank you for that. 
And so our photo contest for <clears throat> November, Betsy, there we go. We have some turkeys who are resting in the trees and they also roost in trees at night um, as well. And um, so this is a photo from a photographer, Andy, I don't know, remember Andy's last name, but it's at the bottom of the photo. He's from Cincinnati. And this is a photo that he took very close to his home. So as you can see, um, there are a lot of opportunities, photo opportunities for turkeys. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my last slide, and we have partnered with uh, several conservation rehabilitation centers. Nature's Conservancy, Conservancy happens to be in White House, Ohio, and these ladies uh, rehabilitate mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. They are going to be Every Friday of the month of November, they are going to have a live presentation from their conservancy at 12 p.m. on our virtual con conference center. And all you need to do is to sign up into our website and click on the virtual center and you will be there. And we also ask for the month of November that if you are giving to a conservation group that does rehabilitation, that you uh, consider these ladies. They also will be telling us the things that they, they need during um, the COVID crisis. Many of these uh, young or very small conservation centers are having um, trouble uh, keeping volunteers because of the virus. They also, uh, so they need volunteers. They also are needing um, uh, food for these animals and birds and others. And you'll be very interested to know the sources of where they can get them and how you can help them uh, provide that food. And I'm sure they're going to tell us what some of these uh, birds and amphibians and reptiles and mammals need to sustain themselves. So it, it they are really a fun kind of Friday at noon during lunch uh, thing to do. So thank you very much. And Nancy, back to you. That was my last thing I had to talk about. That's a lot, Gloria. Thanks That's ever so lot, much. Gloria. Thanks trying to juggle all those things. I don't know why I'm getting an echo. Can we get that off, please? There we are. All right. So, uh, again, so many things juggling. And, Luke, that is a gorgeous photograph of the wood duck. That was beautiful. So I hope somebody can get out there and get a few wild turkey photos um, appropriate for November. That would be great. Um, so we've had a couple of challenges and contests going on. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, since COVID has kind of kept us around in our, our neighborhoods and our homes, um, we came up with some thoughts and said, hey, go out in your neighborhood, do some birding. So one of our first challenges uh, was the Fall Warbler Challenge. And that took place all the month of September and October when warblers were migrating through. Um, yes, new people who to birding could have done the fall warbler challenge, but this was really meant to be for people who are, again, need to get out and, and find as many different species of warbler as they could in the fall. And a couple of folks signed up for that. We will be having a wrap-up on Saturday, November 14th, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, for those people who did sign up and again for those who would like to just see what in the world were, was coming through this area in September and October. So uh, you know join us for that fall warbler birding challenge wrap-up 
Um, I participated. I had a great time and uh, wanted to see a lot more Warblers, but didn't see all that I wanted. But I had a great time going out there. And those fall Warblers are not as challenging as you thought. Or are they? Some of, sometimes they are. So that was that was fun. Um, another thing that we have happening uh, was, or another thing that we have ha had happen, was we had a mask making contest. Since COVID is well, look at that. That's one of our board members, and she had made a mask of a mallard duck beak. Isn't that awesome? But here's the thing: she got students from. Um, Okinawa International University to participate and we had over 20 participants make masks of birds. Some of them are re recognizable like mallard and black crowned night heron but some of those winners and we're going to take a look at a couple of them some of them were again birds that you might find in in Japan or in Asia. So this was a really, really fun contest. We're going to do it again next year, again, around the Halloween time. Um, again, since you have to wear a mask for COVID pre, uh, precautions, why not turn it into something fun? So we did have some winners. Um, and I think we're going to go through uh, those, those winners. Uh, one of the winners was a, um, somebody who created a lovebird mask. I think we have it on the next slide. There we are. All righty. But you can see how that beak is turned down, like a, a, a peach-faced lovebird. And uh, look at uh, the de decorations on it. So beautiful. So beautiful. So that was a first place winner. Um, a second winner, and I think that's our next slide. Whoa, a crow mask. Look at that with the, with the, with the uh, sequins on it. Man, I, I don't know if she sewed those on one by one, but... Look at that. That looks cool. And with the dark glasses and the dark hair, perfect. What a great, what a great uh, second prize. And our third place. Let's take a look at our third place winner. Wow, check this one out. Look at with the helmet on, the little eyes. Do you notice what's on top of the helmet? Yeah, it's a crayfish. You're right. Because the intermediate egret is apparently consumes a, a lot of crayfish. So what, again, what a great mask. These are so fun. And like I say, about 20, uh, 20 participants, I believe the other masks or all the masks can be observed on our website. Uh, there's a gallery. And so you can take a look at them all. What, again, what great fun. So this is one that we're definitely going to do next year. Uh, again, around the Halloween time. So we hope we get a lot more participants. This was fun. And our voting was up to our members and guests to, of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. So um, you could look through the, the gallery and say, yep, I like that one for first prize. I like that one for second. I like that one for third. So, so this, this is, uh, again, a lot of fun. And we have, I think we have one more thing happening shortly. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, aha, the day after Thanksgiving, we have what's called the fledgling birding challenge. No, we're not going to look for fledgling birds. This was named because we want people who maybe don't get out or haven't gone out, uh, kids, maybe shut-ins, maybe an older person in your family, just to get out and become a new birder. Uh, so our fledgling birding challenge is taking place on the Friday after Thanksgiving. And what we're going to provide for you once you sign up is a list of 19 species of birds like this blue jay to find in and around the neighborhood or maybe traveling just a little bit. Now, there are spaces for 20 birds. So that 20th bird is going to be a bird that you find that's not on the list. So... Again, what great fun. Day after Thanksgiving, maybe walk off a little bit of those calories from Thanksgiving dinner or get yourself primed for another piece of pie 
when you get home from, from doing some birding. So we hope we have a lot of participants for our fledgling birding challenge. And again, once you sign up, then you will uh, get that list of birds. It's the list of names as well as photographs. So again, should you be a new birder and you don't know what a blue jay is, you look for a bird that looks like that. So again, we're trying to make it easy and fun. And uh, I think it, look, people have a great time. All right. So we have lots and lots of stuff going on. Um, our next presenter will be Amanda Sobrowski. And Amanda works at the Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation Society. Amanda, are you there? Yeah, I am. Thanks. Um, you can move to the next slide. Betsy, thanks. Um, so COVID and an injury has kind of slowed down my efforts to build uh, chimney swift towers. Um, but I recently was contacted by um, the building director in um, the city of Bay Village, which is where I live. Um, next slide. Uh, this uh, uh, denotes the people that have helped me. Uh, Dan Enovich is the Director of Parks and Recreation and Jonathan Leskovic, uh, Director of Public Services. They were both really helpful in getting approvals and finding a site. And um, so um, they, they were really helpful and I'm grateful for that. Um, uh, Jonathan recently contacted me and said, you know, he's all excited because the chimney swift tower is almost done, but they had made some improvements. So um, I'm a little worried about their improvements. I'm sure it will make it sturdier, but unfortunately, um, when you see the, the piping here, the metal, that goes on the inside. And um, because of the it's wide. I'm afraid that little birds can't climb over it because it's two inches wide. And also it's got bolts uh, that stick into the nesting chamber. So I've asked him to change that design or we can't use it because it's pointless to have a, a nesting box that um, will harm the birds. So um, since I asked him to change it. I haven't heard from him, so we'll see what happens with that. So good and bad. Uh, next slide. Betsy. <laughs> okay, this is where it's going to be if it comes to pass. Um, you can see in the background there is a um, life preserver on a post uh, j just in front of the lake. Um, they'll move that to the side and the, um, the tower will go just a little bit in front of that. So it's a really excellent place for it to be. Um, it's away from overhangs. I'm going to put a native plant garden around it and then they'll give me some low barriers to keep people from walking into the flower garden. So it is a, it's a really beautiful spot and um, if it's well accepted, uh, we'll try to build more towers. So um, down at the bottom of the page, you can see the Facebook page. If anyone would like to go there, and they can uh, keep up with uh, any updates I have there. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and of course, we always, uh, Amanda, always appreciate the donations. These chimney mm -hmm. towers are not inexpensive. Uh, so please, again, if you check out that. Uh, part of the website and would like to do give a donation. Uh, every little bit helps um, because the chimney swifts are having a little bit of a, a problem as far as uh, nesting areas and of course uh, any aerial insectivore, the insects just are not as abundant as they used to be. So we're going to try to, to help some of these species that need a little bit of assistance. Thanks so much. I think uh, the chimney strips are down in South America now, aren't they? Yeah, they should Amanda? be, or at yeah. least heading that way. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're there yet. Yep. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. just crazy amazing. Long All right. Trip. Well, I just got a couple more real quick. Yep. Got a couple more real quick announcements. 
Um, yes, we've got a Christmas bird count coming up. Um, that it is the 121st Christmas bird count, and our circle called the Lakewood Circle. Uh, our count is on Sunday, December 27th. Um, we are going to have uh, some pre-Christmas count events, uh, virtual events where we we'll gather. We'll talk a little bit about areas that need coverage, how to cover the area, how to keep track of your hours. Uh, we'll also do a, a presentation on some confusing species. So just to clarify, once you're out there and you're like, oh, is that a purple finch? Is that a house finch? Is that a pine siskin? Is that type of stuff. We'll be doing that. Um, we need people to take any part of our count circle, which, uh, again, check the website. You can see where our circle lands. It's called the Lakewood Circle because that's where the center point is, but it extends along Lake Erie down to the Strongsville, Middleburg Heights border. Uh, it, it even extends a little bit into Lorain County, just a scooch. Uh, all the way to, um, uh, where else, Parma Heights, uh, some parts of, of Old Brooklyn. So again, it's, it's quite a large area. So please see if you can participate in our 121st Christmas bird count, going out, counting species, or uh, tallying species and counting individual birds. So it's a lot of fun, part of the day, all day, we have driving routes, we've got feeder watchers, so we hope that you can participate. Uh, next slide, please. And next month, on Tuesday, December 1st, uh, at 7.30, right, uh, on this virtual station, uh, we are going to have a, a cool presentation on lichens. It's an overlooked organism. And Tomas Curtis, who's a botany student at Kent State University, will be talking to us about lichens. And I think you're going to liken what he has to oh, Got it? Liken what he has to say? No, I think you're going to be totally amazed at, at the information that he's going to be able to present. So I hope that you can join us again Tuesday, December 1st for the lichens presentation. But I know this evening uh, everybody is just waiting for uh, tonight's uh, presentation. And uh, tonight um, we have to welcome uh, Dr. Hunter King back. Uh, we originally had him scheduled for the spring. And of course everybody knows what happened in the spring. COVID hit. So we had to cancel our presentations, our live presentations, but Dr. King was kind enough to reschedule to now in November. And it's, it's a fascinating subject, the emergent mechanics of cupness and its mechanical th synthesis. A mouthful, but I think you're going to get it because, you know, nature has been creating things for millions of years. And biomimicry, people are looking at how nature has, has modified, has been able to adapt, has been able to evolve, and birds uh, just have been able to select some things, and people are looking at things that birds select, and how they're woven together, and well, I'm going to let Dr. King take it away. So I want to welcome Dr. Hunter King, uh, physicist and polymer scientist at the University of Akron. Dr. King, we are so thrilled to have you this evening. Oh, and I do want to mention that Dr. King will welcome or does welcome questions. So if you uh, would like to type questions into the ch chat while he's talking, uh, or uh, at the bottom of your screen, there are uh, little things that you could do a hand raise. Uh, let me see if I can get my little hand, my paw raised here. There you go. Raise hand. It'll look like that coming up on the screen. And we'll call on you and you can uh, either uh, type your question in or we can have you unmute and ask your question. So Dr. King, thank you, thank you, thank you again so much for this evening. Yeah, so I was just saying it's, a, it's an honor to be competing with the messy unveiling of the election results right now. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, so, right, the, the, the title is maybe a bit of a mouthful. Um, 
I, there's another way of saying uh, what I mean by emergent mechanics, the cupness and mechanical synthesis, a little bit more simply is what does this bird know about granular physics that we don't? Um, so I was originally thinking of just diving right into the weeds here, but it, it seemed to me that there's a couple of things that are worth addressing, partly because most of the thing I had to share today is, is the perspective or a framing of a question. Um, and it kind of helps to know where um, we're coming from there. Also, um, biomimicry means a lot of different things to different people, perhaps. Um, so I want to show how um, someone with my background ended up in it or in some part of the spectrum. Um, it's certainly not where I expected to be. Um, so the first thing that seemed useful to point out is um, a perspective or a mindset uh, in physics. So that's, my background is entirely in physics through a ridiculously non, long number of years, uh, it, you know, as a student. Um, but the things that are most deeply taken away for me is that we're always trying to find a central, simple thing that makes sense of many complicated things. Or maybe another way of putting this is um, we like to use as little science as possible to under, understand as much of nature as possible. Um, so this kind of doesn't always work well with biology, so it was kind of a long arc for me to get into this position. Um, so I don't want this to be like a, a biographical thing, but I'm going to share a little bit of where I was before I got here. Um, so my PhD was in a kind of a, 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 a funny topic. Um, it was straight up a mechanical uh, phenomenon, uh, you know, that does, that does fall in the category of physics. But we were interested in the question of why do thin sheets sometimes uh, buckle in one way or another way? So there's shapes that you get, motifs of buckling that could be wrinkled, or something that could, could, we could call crumpling, right? And these things are not really obvious. It's a little bit of a, a, a question that's up in the air. So we tried to uh, tie this down with experiments. And the experiment that I did to try to contribute to this question is by putting a very thin sheet of, in this case, it was a nanoscopically thin polystyrene on the surface of a droplet of water, right? And we looked at this system in order to understand where this pattern was coming from, this wrinkling pattern, and we tried to manipulate the system by changing the surface from something that was flat to something that was more bulging out to see how this very, very simple system would start to create uh, complexity by having a, something we might call wrinkled and something we might call crumpling. And I don't want to get into the, the details here too much, but that type of question really related back to what makes, you know, what is appealing to me in that we can, the, the part of this was, was involving a very simple theory about what it means to wrinkle. In this case, we have a thin sheet, and like any thin thing, if you try to compress it, you try to confine it, it'll buckle. Right? It likes to bend more than it likes to be compressed on its, in its, its main direction. Um, but there's a very simple way of looking at um, what happens when you buckle something when there's some resistance to having a large amplitude, like going away from the surface by a large, large amount. So if you're confining this buckled state to um, you know, a small amplitude, you end up having to make up that extra length in making many little bumps. And that's the whole theory, basically, you know, formalized a little bit more um, for uh, wrinkling on, on different scales for different reasons. We've got some amount of a parameter that's associated with bendability of a, of a, of a thin sheet and something that's related to what's preventing it from buckling way out of plane. Um, and so, you know, the, the basic theory can be applied to different circumstances. Maybe you see wrinkling of a film under tension. Um, but the important thing about it, or the thing that I think is kind of satisfying and maybe starts to be relevant, is that it's a simple concept, a simple formulation that is de independent of scale. So you see something like the, the hills that are formed through plate tectonics. And you've got a thin sheet, the crust of the earth, that's being compressed in one direction and it ends up buckling out um, with some wavelength that we can perhaps predict. I mean, there's more complicated things going on here. But similarly, the, the shapes that you get in, um, in, in cloth when it buckles, 
um, what happens when a, a structure that's made out of thin sheet will buckle, like what, what pattern do you have and how, when do you have an instability. The wrinkling inside an iris, for instance, you can kind of tell it's already going to be the same thing. And even the wrinkling you get inside of, uh, you know, growing uh, leaves uh, that have, uh, have to accommodate more area as the growth rate increases, it gets larger. But in any case, this, this is just an example of a, a, a simple sort of concept that relates to many things across different scales. Um, so when I was finishing up the PhD, there was a, a pull towards moving into biology, and I had resisted this for a long time, and the, the, the main reason for this bias, um, I think I can try to, uh, to characterize quickly by thinking about the, the basic building blocks um, in something like physics where we want to understand simple things carefully. You know, the, the starting point we could consider, you know, an atom in a physics perspective. It's just two very simple things. You can write the whole equation. It's, it's very difficult to solve exactly, but it's like the, the most complicated thing we can solve exactly using quantum mechanics. Um, it's not that simple, but you can see there's not a whole lot going on there. By contrast, in biology, um, the picture that we're shown often when someone is talking about, well, the biological system they're looking at, going down to the, the tiny building block uh, state, uh, state, uh, level um, is this horrible mess. There's just too many things with their own names and all kinds of chemistry going on inside here. Um, these pictures, I think, they, they, they made me angry <laughs> when seeing them originally. It just made, it, it looked like something we just can never understand, and I didn't want to think about biology ever. Um, that, that, that changed gradually, I'm coming around to a different perspective on this. And the reason for this, and maybe I'll see some more examples, is that the, the issue here, the thing that we study when we study a lot of these biological sy systems is not the biology necessarily, but um, the thing that I'm often interested in is the natural selection. Um, so we have, say, two um, objects that are designed in some way or another uh, for flight. Um, and there's a very big difference between the way these, these uh, objects have found their shape um, and their, their modes of flying. Um, when we in engineer something intelligently, um, we, we use a process that's analytical, at least modern engineering, um, which means that we have individual components that perform individual roles. Right? I've heard that the, an airplane is basically um, viewed as a cylinder that you try to make a float, right? And so you have, it moves in one direction, we've got some way of modeling the flow around individual uh, units that will create lift in one direction and then another stabilizing unit somewhere else. Um, so we can understand exactly the guiding principles that go into an object like this, um, whereas the, if there's a natural analog to be found for this type of thing in the structure of a, or the shape of a bird, um, the, the design itself is holistic, which is to say this isn't, doesn't start out as a cylinder and then adds pieces to make different function it has developed over time as a whole solution to many, many different needs. And unlike the design of a, of, a, of a plane, for instance, there's no model for how the air is going to flow around the structures that's going to give it lift in the other functionality. It just, it just happened this way and because it kept working, it kept, uh, you know, it kept persisting, or when it, when it needed to work a little bit better, the variation was able to provide slightly better options that would persist more, right? But the point is that, you know, we, we can still think about how this other system works, and um, the, the, the physics that's used in both of these cases are the same. Um, the insight also is extractable, and that's taken me a long time to really come around to. Um, in the case, for instance, we, we I mean, this is beyond me, but, you know, in understanding how a bird can fly quickly, right, for, for some, you know, a plane can only fly at high speeds because the, the, the calculation for the lift only works that way. You don't have different uh, changes shape. The bird can fly fast, and then it can actually slow down and come to a landing position. 
um, which will definitely use the same equations, you know, we can describe by the same equations of fluid dynamics, but it's being manipulated in a way that we don't understand yet. And that's not my business exactly, but it's an example. Um, uh, should I, 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 maybe should pause every once in a while for if there is any questions that have come up. Uh, please do interrupt me, like I said. It gives me a sense I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> But if I, if I can kind of continue this arc a little bit farther before coming back to birds, I'm going to say then the, the, the next thing that the system that kind of got me towards thinking about something like a bird nest was in the postdoc. Uh, so by some perhaps complicated misunderstanding as things go, I ended up in a position of, of, of being funded to study the termite mound and try to understand uh, what its uh, what its function was based on, right? So the, the termite mound um, is a, a gigantic structure. It's built by very small in insects. Um, the structure is built on top of where the nest is. It's under the nest is underground. So there's a lot of um, speculation about what it's for. Um, the main and, and again trying to avoid details. Um, the the main idea that we were working with is that. This structure is somehow functioning as a lung. So it's an abiotic structure that will uh, impart some physiological function to the actual biology that's somewhere else in the system. Um, but how it works is something that is really difficult to see at least at first glance. It must be doing something to uh, move air around and let it escape in exchange with the environment in order to exchange the CO2 that's building up in the nest and uh, bringing in fresh air. But with no moving parts, it wasn't clear how we, you know, how it makes an internal flow that would, would, would cause this to happen. Um, so in this case, um, our approach was is still, you know, using the same experimentation, some instrumentation on our own. We built some probes that could be used for this purpose and tried to understand or characterize the flow that was moving inside the mound and see if it correlated with the wind and see what else it depended upon to try to understand what is pushing the air. And in this case, what we found was uh, the, the conduit flow or the flow in the conduits was changing direction and its magnitude, um, you know, one in one full oscillation over the course of a day. And the, the flow pattern was changing uh, with the gradient of the temperature between the inside and the outside. And again, without getting too many details, this led us to um, a pretty, I mean, being pretty convinced about what the mechanism is. And this, you know, turned out to be an example where um, this insect makes a large structure, and that structure is a lot more smart than we might think. Um, it is going to respond to the daily, daily heating and cooling by um, equilibrating with the environment, right? So that, the outer bits will cool down and heat up faster, and the inside will uh, take longer. It'll be more buffered. Um, but because of that, you end up at any time in the day or at night, you have a gradient that's going to push some convective flow on the inside. And so it was sort of an example of the, the architecture itself um, taking this passive mechanism to drive some physiological function. Anyway, so this is where I was at and finally, you know, ended up in uh, a position um, which is, you know, in polymer science, which is not quite where I'm from, um, and it's still within biomimicry now. Now we're, we're full on looking at biological systems, but trying to understand the, um, the physical mechanisms that are underlying um, what's going on in these solutions. Um, and we'll use, we use in the lab our own kind of... Uh, tabletop experiments and our open source instrumentation that we use in field measurements. Um, but anyway, so that's where we're at now. And one of the projects we've been working on is the topic of the talk today. Um, that is um, the granular physics as applies to a bird nest. Is there any questions uh, so far? No, I'm not seeing no, I'm not any okay. any questions yet. Yeah. Although somebody did make a comment that they said it was fascinating so far. Okay. 
Well, all right, so thanks for bearing with me because I this has all been a roundabout way of saying, you know, why I'm in the position of talking about a bird nest um, and how naive I am about uh, biology. So we'll finally get to um, where I meant to get. Do you see this uh, little window up here? I don't know if I can get rid of Oh, oh, ah, I can see the chat now. And I see a raised hand. That's not intended to be a raised hand. Okay. Um, all right. That, that's interesting. Okay. So, uh, so finally, back to bird's nests. Um, if we ask the basic question, uh, what are they for in some sense, a question that gets me in trouble with biologists, um, I'm going to say that this, like, say, a termite mound, is a part of an abiotic structure. It is an abiotic structure that does contribute to the physiological function of, uh, for the brood, right? So the egg, um, the, the nest exists, as far as I understand, um, at least in the examples that I've been have seen, um, exists only for the, the uh, fitness of the egg as it develops, right? So <clears throat> the things that it has to be able to accommodate are some amount of uh, thermoregulation, right? So the, the structure has to help with keeping the heat to some degree. Um, there have been measure, uh, experiments showing that uh, the actual structure will be preferentially uh, buffered in the direction of the wind, for instance, um, that will help with this. And the insulation that is used um, will also help with uh, not letting the, um, the heat out. Um, respiration is extremely important. Um, so the, the egg has to exchange respiratory gases because there's a metabolism in there. And the thing that's kind of interesting about this that I won't go into too much is that the egg has got its own transport mechanism for, for respiratory gases. It has to exchange actually water. So the egg has pores in it and some amount of, of conductivity to release the vapor through those pores. That has to be coupled with the conductivity of the nest. And that's not trivial. So you have to be able to exchange um, some moisture in order to actually have the respiration happen without losing too much heat, for instance, depending on where you are. And that's one of those subtle things that it all has to be built into the same structure. Um, you know, the limitations on any particular parameter can't, you know, make the other ones not work anymore. Um, and of course, the, 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 another one is safety from predators. So one of the main reasons why, as far as I understand, uh, birds are, are so um, uh, versatile with building nests is because of intense competition um, for the more safe nests. They can't find spots on the ground or just holes in trees anymore. They have to build out of their own materials because um, they, they run out and they need to keep the brood safe. All right, so I'm not going to talk so much about any of these. But um, I'm going to focus on the more uh, simple question that whatever you're using to, to make this nest, um, it has some additional mechanical demands. Um, and that is that it, it has to keep its shape to some degree, um, especially for nests that are built uh, more exposed to the wind and a bird is going to keep landing on it. It has to keep its shape to not lose the, 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 the eggs. Um, they can't fall apart. Um, so they have to do this, right? Um, and they have, this is achieved by manipulating found materials. So there is too much diversity within all bird nests. Um, there's a lot of filamentous material that's used. Mud is used. I don't remember actually what this was. It looks like some kind of seaweed or something is used. Or, or I mean, there's a wide variety of materials um, that still have to achieve these goals. Um, so putting it in a slightly different um, sort of spectrum in terms of the mechanics, um, we can think, um, you know, at least speculatively about how the mechanical um, function is going to come from the pieces that are used. So the scrape nest, I don't think about it. Seems like that's kind of a trivial case. Um, there's probably interesting things to be said about it, but I haven't thought of them. Um, platform nests, I mean, we can think of these as, you know, something uh, like masonry in their stability. Once you get these uh, uh, large weights on top of um, elements in the bottom that are holding it together, it becomes more and more uh, sturdy. Um, the cup nest I will get back to. 
Um, but uh, say hummingbird nests, where they have extremely flexible material that's that's um, that is, is stretched. It seems to involve processes that are like lashing, um, and the way they do uh, poke the flexible filaments through the material is very reminiscent, at least, of the felting process. Um, so there's some techniques that are kind of more complicated, and of course the weaver birds, um, that's, that's almost um, frustratingly complicated. They seem to know how to tie proper knots um, and will actually weave. So that is beyond the, the scope that I'd like to think of things. Um, but it's very interesting how you end up with mechanical structure, especially this amount of tensile uh, stability you have. Um, but the thing that I did want to, the, the thing that stood out for me thinking about this problem, um, still within the, the postdoc actually, was um, the, the cup nest. Um, and this is kind of intriguing because the, the bird that, that uses these sort of um, intermediate, not not exactly uh, fibers, not exactly um, hard grains, but these sort of intermediate sticks. Um, they're put together in a disordered way. Almost looks like it's an application of granular physics, um, and they are expecting what this output material is going to be, right? And that is um, somewhat shocking because, well, as we can see, like this is maybe not the best example of this kind of emergent stiff nest, but the bird has chosen a lot of materials and is not putting it together like we might make it house, obviously, right? Um, by, by putting every piece in deliberately for a particular role, but rather takes a, ch a clump of it and then shoves it around. So it is giving the impression that there is some anticipation of these materials that are found outside somewhere when they're brought and just shoved into place around this nest, that they will become um, a different type of material, right? They were originally individual skinny pieces of stuff. And then in the end, you can get a structure that can be a bit cohesive, right? So that transition is something that um, we don't expect the birds are anticipating, but their, their, their behavior suggests that they do, right? So it's, it's, I guess worthwhile saying that we also now know how to manipulate granular materials, right? We do this for a long time. Uh, and what I mean by granular materials is, you know, individual grains that collectively become some kind of different continuous substance almost. And those grains are something that are way larger than a molecule, right? So they have friction and they have some internal heat that doesn't relate to their motion. Um, so we, we, of course, manipulate granular materials in food, um, you know, in, in uh, in silos. This is probably the third silo picture. There's going to be more of them. I don't, I was kind of shocked to see that. Um, pharmaceuticals, right, manipulation of powders, kind of same deal, and in construction, um, right? So the things, the thing about granular materials is that their, their properties are far from trivial, right? It's, it's so ubiquitous, we kind of take it for granted. But even in the um, hourglass, we can see something that's a little bit um, maybe difficult to make sense out of in that we, we see that there is flow, right, through the neck. Um, and flow indicates a state that's fluid, right? That's kind of the, the definition of a fluid is that it flows, right? And it clearly does. It does so consistently enough that um, we can actually use it, make a time B space out of it. Um, interestingly, the timepiece wouldn't work with water, right? We, this only works because of granular mechanics. But when, when it, after it flows, it lands on the bottom, and very much unlike a liquid, it doesn't level off, right? If this thing could continue to flow, it should be flat here. And it's not. And so there's something solid-like about the state here and liquid-like about, or fluid-like about the state here. And so it's already, you know, giving a sign that things are weird. Um, and some of the weirdness about uh, granular materials has been known for a, a very long time. Oh, sorry, I have not been monitoring the, the chat. I can click on this. Huh. All right, that's easy enough. Okay. All right, so since the, I guess, uh, turn of the last century, um, the... 
um, the, some of the weirdness about granular materials has been noticed, right? And this is uh, famous, uh, the Anston effect, um, in which, um, again, pouring in a granular material like corn, um, you see what ha the, the load on the bottom increases, right? So the more corn you put in here, the, the load starts to continuously increase, right? So if you look at the pressure on the bottom and the amount of corn you have, they go up. Initially, something would be like linear, right? Um, so more, more height of corn or more mass of corn gives you more pressure on the bottom. If this was a, a liquid, you would see this uh, as it continues to fill, this line just keeps going straight up. Um, but what happens is um, because this is a granular material and not a liquid, it flows, but then it becomes something like a solid, um, the relationship kind of tapers off. So you end up saturating the pressure on the bottom as you keep adding more and more of this corn, right? And this is the principle that makes a silo work. These things can be gigantic and still be kind of skinny at the bottom. And that's because the, the, the bottom is not carrying the whole load anymore. Um, the load is actually being um, carried a bit by the edges, by the sides, right? Because, um, you know, the bottom pressure had only gone up to a certain amount and then it stopped, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of weird. Um, it's also the first evidence of something we'll call jamming. Um, and the jamming is the, the, the process by which a granular material goes from being a fluid to being a, a, a solid. It's a disordered solid, unlike, you know, say it's not a crystal. Um, so it's a, it was a, a, a disordered fluid become a disordered solid. And in this state, we see that um, if you do, you know, people use optical methods to illuminate where the stresses are in such a material. And you can see that the stresses are borne by a, a small fraction of all of the, the particles in here. So it's very disordered, and the result is that you've got a really, really non-uniform um, distribution of stresses. Um, and these force chains do end up creating uh, networks that will hold on to the sides and then start bearing weight. So that's the, like, the conceptual picture of what the solid state of a granular system is and what that transition between uh, a, a fluid and uh, solid is. Um, the thing that was interesting even back then is that um, you could uh, characterize this whole curve um, based on one parameter. And that parameter seemed to depend on the shape and the friction of an individual um, element, right? So if you looked at, if you could characterize the continuous behavior of this thing by just the shape and the friction of the pieces that went into it, right? So that's, that's getting towards um, a description of a real material, um, right? It's, it's not just the sum of all of these little particles that are, you know, a certain amount of hard, um, but rather the continuum is described in a simple way, just knowing what the shape and the friction is. Okay. Okay. Um, so the... Uh, it, Continuing on that train of thought, um, if we can describe the, the, the granular material in terms of very few parameters, right, we want to avoid the complexity and just boil it down to uh, simple features, simple statistical features. Um, we can think of two quantities, um, and this is what it mostly comes down to in audit systems. One is the volume fraction, so it's just how much of the total volume is occupied by the granular material, right? And that's, we can call that a more geometrical quantity. Um, the quantity that more directly relates to the mechanical response is the average contact number. So if you look at a little bit of the material, how many is the one element touching? Um, and so that means that your Z, the contact number, is four here and three here. You can actually have a stable material for which, you know, Z is, is less than the maximum, right? Um, but you can characterize the, the packing based on these two parameters. Um, and the thing that is, again, getting closer to the question of how this type of material will be manipulated is noticing that um, there are states that can be defined. Um, one is the, the loose packed state, 
So it's minimally stable. It's the smallest volume fraction you can have and not have this system fall apart. And then there's the state where if you keep shaking it, trying to settle it as much as you can, or keep forcing it into a, a more and more packed state, it will stop packing. Uh, and it'll stop packing before it gets to crystallized state. Right? If, if it's, it's still disordered, it's not in the crystalline structure that you would get that is the absolute maximum packing. But this state is very well defined. Right? The, the actual volume fraction is something like 0.63. And the thing that is important is that um, you will tend towards this as you try to pack. And it doesn't matter that much how you tried to get there. Some generic protocol to do that, uh, to pack it, is, is, is all you need to get to this, this state. Um, and that is indicative of there being some kind of self-assembly of material. That means that you can just take the individual starting pieces, you know, the starting elements, and then expect it to pack to a particular density um, uh, without having to, to, to prescribe that. Um, and so some of this has been applied to some other, uh, you know, really novel systems. Um, it's the jamming transition is not something that comes up as much in, I don't know, um, uh, conventional in industry, I guess. Um, but there's some, some examples you can think of as, as, uh, as gripper in which you, you have a granular material inside that's not confined very much, and you have it flow basically around an object, and then you pull the air out, so it becomes a, a stiff, it becomes confined, and then it can't flow, and then you can grab something, right? And the other thing that's useful about some granular materials is uh, the way that it will respond to shock. Um, so if you have this uh, fairly loose state that suddenly has um, a force that's making it try to jam, you end up with large energy dissipation. That's been documented as well. So these are somewhat obscure, but they're pointing to some novel uses of uh, granular material. Um, the thing is, birds don't just use straight up um, round grains that we're fond of um, studying. Um, they rather will typically, they will typically use filamentous materials, right? And that's probably not just a coincidence, right? So it's somewhere, I would describe it as uh, in the spectrum between a spheroid, so a round thing, maybe it's a little bit longer in one direction, or like M&M shape to uh, other kind of sphere. Um, and the other extreme end would be uh, fiber. So fiber is just as floppy, it will bend under its own weight. Um, the fact that you would manipulate something that's between these two limits um, is intriguing, and it's also something that we just don't, we don't know how systems like this work very well. We don't apply them to things, as far as I know. Um, so this is where we're getting at when trying to um, not, you know, do a broad survey of how uh, birds use these materials and characterize those directly. Uh, most of the work we've been doing is trying to simplify what that system seems to be, you know, physically, and then manipulate it in our own controlled circumstances, right, our own controlled conditions. Um, so we're thinking, all right, there's more complicated stuff going on in the bird's nest, but let's see straight rods with some characterizable flexibility, which we can measure, and uh, friction. And we can have a, a, a very simple construction protocol is just shake them, let them settle down on their own and see what type of material this is. It's not the same as what a bird does, or any particular bird does, but as we've seen in some cases, it seemed like they are using some, some amount of self-assembly in the packing, and then seeing what emerges from that. Um, so this is showing as we're shaking you know, a bunch of sticks, it will gradually settle. Um, and it settles in a way that it's, it's very much still um, completely disordered. There, uh, Rods on the outside that are standing straight up, but those ones don't seem to participate in the deformation, so they're not important. They're just aligned by the boundaries. Um, so that's what we can, we can do this very simple experiment, and some of this has been done previously, um, to see how um, these types of materials will pack. And the most important thing is to see if you take just this kind of long, skinny material, is it going to pack reliably in a way that doesn't 
you know, require you prescribing um, uh, how it ends up, right? Can you do a generic protocol and still get um, a, a particular packing fraction? Um, so this has been studied before with, with spheroids. So the, on the x-axis here is aspect ratio. So this is how skinny it is. This is M and M in the sphere, and this is longer and longer skinny. And so when you're around spheroidal um, shape, so not very long, it's a little bit crazy behavior. You've got perfectly round as this kind of special case. Um, but you see the packing fashion starts to go down as they become a bit longer. And the contact number, right, so how much connected are all of these when they're packed, um, goes to a minimum at, at, at spherical, and then it goes up to something around 10. Um, for rods, which is just slightly different, um, you know, uh, different shape altogether, it's, it's cylindrical rather than being sort of oblong, um, we see for a much, much larger aspect ratio um, that we have a, a well-behaved uh, packing fraction. So we go to a lo longer and longer, skinnier um, uh, sticks. You see the packing fraction keeps going down in a way that's not again, dependent on the particular things we do to it. And similarly with the contact number, they seem to approach this about 10, so about 10 contacts per individual filament without having to prescribe that. You just push them together and that will eventually be the state that you get. And so the important thing here is that even though there's this perfect disorder, it's very difficult to identify any structure that's being formed on the inside, you still have a robust state that comes out of it. Right, the statistics are going to be uh, predictable. So it is almost as though you're processing a real material with these properties. <coughs> right, which is what we want to think about if this is you know, an exercise in material science. The bird is putting these things together to make something that's going to have a predictable performance. Okay. So a couple of things that also happen in terms of the mechanics um, of the system, what kind of state it falls into. Um, I, I mentioned that for round grains, you have a, um, if the grains in a silo, <clears throat> you'll, it'll behave like a solid. But if you open the door, it's going to pour out. Right? So there's some amount of, of, of solid behavior, but it depends on having boundaries on all sides. You can also make um, sticks that are of very, you know, kind of kinked shapes, so that it's more difficult for it to flow outward. Um, but these ones will only hold together if they're being loaded. So there's some boundary below, and they're all pushing against that boundary. If this one you turn upside down, it falls apart. Um, there are some nests, right, or there's, there's many examples of nests that seem to be made out of these same kind of just straight particles, more or less, um, that you can pick up and drop, and they'll still be one object, right? Even though there's no explicit cohesion between any of the contacts, right? So this seems to be a, a different type of behavior that you get when you're long and skinny and possibly flexible, as I'll get to. Um, so that's what we're thinking about. There's another experiment that had been done previously um, where they looked at um, uh, staples, basically, a bunch of pile of, pile of staples, and they shook it up and down and saw how quickly it would fall apart, um, how easily it would fall apart, um, and how much it would pack. And they claimed that um, the, you know, and they could see that as a function of the amount of penetration they have, so how deep the staples were, you would get something that was more stable, right, if they were very deep. So they could say the interpenetration is what was causing these things to fall, hold together. Right? They can't unentangle as they're being disturbed like this. And it's clear that that should play a role in a real system where you've got you know, funny shapes of these sticks. Um, but they claim that in the biological world, um, some of these nests are held together through this interpenetration uh, of the body parts and branches. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a different statement, and that's what we're thinking of trying to address more directly. Right? This is not um, an expression of cohesion or rigidity. Right? So it's not how you get a solid object. It's how you get something that's not going to fall apart on its own. Um, but the thing that is not taken into account in uh, these, other, uh, these other examples is one of the things that happens when you go from 
dealing with a, a grains that are just mostly round. So the interactions between these, you know, they might be able to exert a torque. You know, if there's some friction, they'll be able to rotate this one be based on its interaction, or there'll be some compression. Right? So they'll just push directly against each other. Um, for slender grains, you have the opportunity for bending to occur. And that's, that's kind of obviously true. But how this uh, bending will play out when you've got lots of these uh, elements interacting with each other and sometimes bearing weight seems to be very important. Right? And in one example you can show that kind of uh, illuminates this difference is um, I can take, you know, four sticks exactly, yes, four sticks, and uh, weave, you know, one underneath one of them, above the other one, and then below the other one. Do, e do that for each of these sticks until it comes back on top of itself. And so this is a way of taking um, sticks that are able to bend, and you can put it in a state where there is some amount of bending being done. They would like to relax themselves, but there's another stick in the way. And because they're all leaning on another stick, it can't undo itself, right? So this is the minimal example. You can't do it with less sticks than, than four. The minimal example of how you can get to a rigid structure um, without having any hooks on anything. It does require that there's individual flexibility and some resistance to flexibility. These, one, these have to be trying to get out of this stage in order for it to hold itself together, kind of counterintuitively. Um, so we, we're speculating, at least early on, and we haven't seen this state, that there should be a nestability that you can approach. If you can tune the friction, the flexibility, and the loading, which is part of what makes this hold itself together, if you can make all of those elements come, to come together in a disordered way, so that within the structure you have loaded contacts um, in such a way that it can't, it, nothing can move without everything else moving at the same time. Um, and there's some evidence that birds might be trying to induce this state by tucking in um, the uh, pieces that are poking out to try to load additional contacts. Um, but this is something that would be very distinct, um, sort of uh, different phase of this collective material is depend on the flexibility. Um, the thing that's oops, the thing that's also um, kind of unusual, right, is, I mean, I guess I kind of alluded to this, the force chains that I talked about, the distribution of the stresses you have in a granular material, um, you know, I said was very non-uniform and it was all just direct uh, compression between nearby elements. Um, we want to think of the slender grains as distributing its stresses um, in a way that is similarly disordered and collective as this state, but there's no way we know how to visualize them though. If they're involving some of these bending modes that are holding on to each other, it's hard to say what this means. So this is another um, thing we would like to understand about a system that's made out of um, these kind of slender um, bendable grains. Um, so to get towards the, um, the mechanics of this, we've developed a really, really basic um, setup to uh, drive compression cycles, right? So we get that state that we can now call a material um, that is, you know, emergent from these, these particles just being stuffed together and start to characterize how it responds to loads, right? So we push it, we push it, we push it, we push it. We know what the overall compression is because we're monitoring the, the rotation of this gear, um, and we know what the overall load is because we're measuring it from below. So the type of curve that you get out of this, um, this stress-strain curve, um, will tell you a couple of things about your material. Um, and this is, you know, what people do to characterize a material in general. Um, and so if you, if you look at one cycle, you say, you can go to increasing stress as you're decreasing the height, so you're pressing more. Um, you see the load increases, and then when you come back, it decreases. And a typical thing is that when you get to the end, you might not be where you started. 
you get to zero stress, you get to zero load, but you're, you're no longer at the original um, height that you were. And this is an indication of irreversible deformation, that's what we call plasticity, right? So if that happens, you know that it's because there's been some rearrangement that didn't come back. Um, but the other thing you can see that over this cycle, you end up having pushed hard in one direction, and then as you're coming back, you're not pushing as hard anymore. So that's a, a behavior of something that's not springy exactly. If you see this together, it's a little bit harder to interpret, but um, this is it's indication of work being done between this whole process. Um, but if, if we take our system and um, push it over and over and over again, what we see happens is the, the irreversible part goes away. So we end up with a state that seems to be maximally packed, um, but it doesn't, um, the hysteresis doesn't go away, right? The area in this curves. So if we push this one over and over many times, then we take another curve, it comes back a different path than it went up. And this indication of there being some steady state hysteresis, right? There's some area of that curve that indicates that energy has been spent, even though it hasn't deformed altogether. Right? It hasn't, it's, it got back to where it started. Where did that energy go is not as obvious. Um, but it is important for the mechanical response of the material. You're actually absorbing energy then in these deformations. Um, so we can look at this for these systems, um, like I mentioned, across that, that spectrum from round to extremely skinny. And the behavior is generic. Um, so you have some you know, in the rounder case, you, you can go to much, much smaller strain before the stress gets, gets, uh, gets high. Um, but the overall shape is about the same. You have some cycles in the beginning that you, you're doing a lot of plastic work. Um, but at the end, you have a cycle that's pretty much lying on top of itself. So all of these things seem to have some um, uh, steady state hysteresis. So the final state, you keep pressing on it and you keep spending energy. This in material science is usually associated with uh, viscoelasticity. So rubber will do this, for instance. Um, but the explanation is very different. Um, there's some liquid-like viscosity that's happening in the material that's responsible for this. Um, but for us, it's obviously not the same case. Um, so we're sorry. Um, so we're left with some of these. Um, um, experiments we can use to characterize what the material is like, um, but what we want to do is understand how that is relating to a process on the inside of it. And now, as you see, we've gotten way into the weeds of the, the granular physics of it. We've strayed a bit from birds, but I'll try to come back at, at some point. But um, the, the way we're trying to do this presently is uh, with our collaborators in Illinois that do computational modeling. So they can basically um, make filaments that have elastic properties that we can, they can be matched to our experiments. Um, and then they can do similar, similar uh, um, computational measurements or experiments as, as what we're doing. Um, so normally if you, if you do a simulation, um, the results will come out. You've got all the information, but it has to be taken with a grain of salt because it's not reality. But if we can show that their simulations will match what we do in the experiment, then we can start looking at their simulations um, to get parameters that are really hard for us to get um, in the physical experiments. So for instance, we want to know what the, the contacts are doing on the inside. It's really hard to access that in just a big pile of sticks. <coughs> but if they're not, if they're simulated sticks, then they know where everything is. And it's just a couple of lines of code to extract how all of these things are coming into contact with each other. So we can get all the statistical parameters, and then we can start to see the micromechanics. So that's where we're going, and this is really preliminary still. Um, but with those, uh, the simulations, we can do measurements that will say, you know, um, over a cycle of this compression, how much is a contact moving with respect to the other, you know, the two sticks are moving with respect to each other. And we can use that to see over time many of these cycles We've got some kind of uh, reversible bit, but we've got some trend that's moving in a direction, which means this is some kind of plasticity that's happening. Uh, similarly, we can look at the angles with respect to, say, vertical. 
and how those are gradually changing on average um, gives an indication that we do many of these cycles and it starts to um, settle in a direction, right? Um, um, in the other case, right, when we say we get to a final state when the plasticity is done, when all the permanent deformation is gone, we can look at the origin of the hysteresis, right? And this one seems to be very generic, but I can't find places where it's discussed very much, right? So if we look at the, the way that a contact will move over a cycle, um, you know, one of these little blips from here, and we see, you know, and this is not the best way of doing it, but the way we're trying to do it now is how that change is, is coming on the loading part of the cycle and the unloading part of the cycle. So if these contacts were, were free to move to relax the stresses as this thing was deforming, we would see this be perfectly symmetric. Right? It would start to slide in one direction, on the way back it would slide back. But we know because we have uh, static friction, right? there's some friction between these sticks, it's going to get stuck every once in a while. When the load gets high, it'll get stuck such that it'll keep going down and not move. And then when it comes back up, it will only move until it get, when it gets to a threshold again. And that threshold is going to be different on the unloading cycle as the loading cycle. So this sort of, um, this process um, means that even though you get to the same final state through a cycle, you're doing something different on the way in than you're doing on the way out. And that's what we're thinking as the explanation for why you have this, you know, sharp curve that goes up on the loading and then a, uh, sorry, the gradual curve that goes up on the loading and a sharp curve as it comes back. It's softer on the way back than it went in because the distribution of these contacts is different. So this is getting way into the details here, but um, it is the types of details that will emerge naturally from your choice of individual sticks. So once we understand this, we can say for, say, more slender sticks, more flexible or more frictional, do you get more of this hysteresis, which could be more, say, energy absorbing with, say, the bird coming back and landing on it? Is it going to take more, more of that energy and, and um, disperse it rather than lead to some maybe damage? <clears throat> it will say something about the flexibility as a function of the sticks that you use. So we, we are getting to some, you know, approach to conclusions from the very physical side, but we did want to connect it back to birds. And now I'm going to share something that's kind of more embarrassing. Um, the, we've done some tests with birds. So we thought, okay, um, let's see how birds are going to choose the materials. And then we can give them options, right? Would this bird like to have more stiff or more long or more, you know, uh, more frictional things? Will they look at them and evaluate before trying to incorporate them into a nest? And so the, the zoo was, was nice enough to uh, give us access to a couple of cardinals um, and we were monitoring their use of different materials. And it became clear that this is something that, you know, people who know better um, put a lot of time into doing um, more than, better than we can, right? So the, the results of these experiments were looking at lots and lots of videotapes of, of cardinals thinking about, you know, maybe using a material for something, but not actually ultimately building a nest. Um, so. Since then, we have established a collaboration with um, some proper uh, bird biologists, the behavioral uh, bird biologists, that are going to uh, do more of these experiments with, with finches, I guess, because it's a lot easier, um, but give them options of materials to work with, and then we can analyze the results. And if we do take uh, you know, a, 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 a CT scan of the final results, we can get some of these statistical parameters we know is going to define the system in a way that we can approach from a physical perspective. Right? So this is where we're going. I realize we're, we're getting close to the end of time right now. Um, so this is, this is a hard part. We're going to get towards that at some point. Um, but the, the output of this, this type of thinking, right, um, using these uh, materials that have individual properties and expect the aggregate to function a particular way is something that um, architects are just starting to think about. Right? We don't normally build that way. We don't like to leave a lot of the functionality to an emergent process or we don't want to leave it to 
some disordered system. We want to know where our stresses are bound. But there are some, arche or, uh, some architects that are exploring this concept of aleatory architecture, right? So this disordered um, packings of, say, in this case, these star-shaped um, printable um, elements. And you can build bridges out of them. You can build walls out of them. Um, but it's still a very young um, field. So we are thinking that you know, beyond knowing when these things will pack right, and knowing when these things will jam um, according to their geometry, um, it's useful to understand the further mechanical performance they can have if they start to actually put compression on them. Right? So then it might be more crucial to understand you know, what is it about this mechanics, the mechanics of the element that will lead to you know, uh, bearing loads. And that's what the birds are doing already, it seems. Um, so that's, that's where I'm going to leave it um, now. I should thank uh, a couple of the students in my lab, uh, Nick Wiener and Maron Dibia. Um, my collaborators in, uh, uh, in Illinois is Mattia Metzola and Yashre Basali. Um, the, the, soon the, the people who are starting to talk with, they're helping out with the proper bird experiments of Shoko and Maria and University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And Kim Cook was helpful in the, the, the Akron Zoo. And Mahadavan and uh, San Marco were the, um, my advisor and uh, a student that was working with me on the, the termite project. And we've got some support from NSF for the bird project. If there's questions. I'm totally fascinated. I'll tell you, I was, I was looking at these slides and I'm like, whoa, yeah, I don't understand all the physics, but it was like, oh, this is cool. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can unmute and ask the question on your own or type it into the, okay. I do. Um, <clears throat> what's the hypothesis, Hunter, that uh, are you trying to learn how to use the metrics or the structure of these cup nests to work them into structures that will uh, shelter humans and the stress points? I, I, it was really very, very interesting, and I felt like I was back in college with my physics professor. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful hour. But I just wonder um, what, what outcome are all of you trying to uh, see through this? Is it the incubation, uh, the, the thermonuclear part of it that is it for heat? Is it for structure, like the uh, stability of it? I mean, you see nests that fly out of, of trees and they're still perfect in perfect condition on the ground after a windstorm. So I just wonder what, what's some okay. of the thinking behind that? So as, as far as applications go, certainly if I was the type of biomimic person that would say, all right, they're doing this for this reason, let's just make it do that for us. Um, that would be one approach. I don't know how to do that. That's kind of not my perspective. Um, we're looking for the underlying game that they're playing, right? If there's some approach to it, we can still um, extract from their behavior. And what I mean by this is, say, the example of, of the, the nest that falls from the tree and bounces, and we know that it's, there's no cohesion there individually, right? There's no stickiness between these sticks. What, what is it that allowed that to happen? I don't know how to recreate that. I don't know how to put sticks together to make that happen, and there is nothing from the field that seems closest to explaining that that can tell you. <laughs> so if we can figure out what combination of parameters will lead to, you know, parameters of the sticks and, say, the packing protocol 
that can lead to this state that's cohesive, like the birds can make, that is a generalizable lesson that could apply to different engineering. <laughs> Um, we can we can kind of speculate, you know, it could be useful for, you know, shape forming. I mean, it, it could be useful for, um, say, insulating things, not thermally, but um, structurally, in a way that you have a material that you can completely take apart into the basic elements without damaging anything, but then force it back together into a shape that's going to be very sturdy. That's unusual. Um, usually you have a material that will break if you try to take it apart, and you can't undo that. Well, I, you know, I kept thinking about earthquakes, and if you could find some kind of way to structure something that would bounce back or a shock, absorb the shock of it so that it didn't break apart, but it it stayed together. It might be damaged, but it wouldn't be as damaged as brick and mortar is now. Right. That's just what I was, that was just my thinking, but it's way out there, right? <laughs> no, and, and the, the okay. thing that we would like the most is to be able to write the paper that characterizes that type of function and have an engineer read our paper and then apply it. So that would right. be how we'd hope to fit into that system. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. I really enjoyed it. Any any other questions out there? Again, I'll, you can unmute and ask them. I'm seeing a lot of messages coming in. Fascinating stuff. Great. Very cool. I think it was very cool, too. Like I was like Gloria myself, saying, man, this is just like physics, and this, this is even better because I, just bringing that biological portion together, uh, and I, you know, I'm running through my mind. Oh, I wonder how pigeons. Actually, in nature, um, pigeons in urban areas sometimes don't pick up sticks and make their nest. They pick up wire. If there's a lot of wire, um, they'll make their nests out of wire. Um, and another thing that's happening in nature is plastics. A lot of birds are weaving the, like the, the blue tarp, the shreds from blue tarps into their nest. Now they're not cup nest, it might be more uh, uh, like a Baltimore Oriole hanging nest, um, which then is causing some concern about, again, the thermoregulation in the nest. You know, is it, is it too moist? Is it too hot? So there's there's a lot of things that I'm thinking of. I'm yeah. like, oh, this is fascinating stuff. Those would be really interesting experiments because it might it might confuse the process. If the bird is choosing this material for one type of property, it's usually coupled to another one. Like if it was a stick with this amount of flexibility, then it could count on the thermal regulatory pro uh, performance of it as well. But if it's plastic, it's kind of flexible the right way for the one purpose. It might not function the other way. Right. It's very revealing. Yeah. Yep. Well, I thank you so much for your time. And again, a fascinating topic. Uh, I wish you well, you and your colleagues well, in, in getting the birds to choose the right materials that you, that you need to, to have their nests created and watching them. Thank you. All right, thank you, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Uh, you can tune into your TV now, or radio, or internet, and see what's going on with the election, or not. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, good night.